much. Well, um, it is Father's Day, and um, one of the things that I get to do on Father's Day that I don't get to do on any other day is I get to tell a few dad jokes. Um, it's like I have license to do that today. And so this is my gift to all the dads in the room. Um, these are no, Maybe you want to write these jokes down so that you can annoy your kids and your grandkids for the rest of your life with these. Um, but these are classics, and if they go over as well as they have in the first two services, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have some interesting moments here. Okay, and so um, here, here we go. So uh, why did the invisible man turn down the job offer? Just couldn't see himself doing it. That's good, right? That's good right there. So somebody needs to take that down. Brad, you got that one down? You got it? Get your phones out. Take some notes. All right, guys. Um, here's another one. Why couldn't the bike stand up by itself? It was too tired. That's good. That's good right there. Isn't it good, Chris? You like that one? That's good. I like that one. Um, then, then my last one, I, I limited myself to three today. I could, I could go on, but here we go. A bear walks into the bar and asks the barkeep, can I have a grilled... Uh, cheese and the bartender asked the bear well what's with the big paws and the bear says well I'm a bear <laughs> that's a time delayed one I mean it, it is you'll get that one later Jason all right so we'll, we'll get it later so um, it, it is Father's Day and dads I men and dads I just want to talk to you for just a second then we're going to jump into the sermon but I, I hope you know just how important and how vital you are to your family and, and to this church um, you are incredibly important to the direction of your family, their faith, their practice. You have no idea how much weight you carry, men. I, I wanted to share with you just some, some stuff that, I, that, I, that I've come across. Uh, they, they do surveys on this kind of stuff to where they try to figure out you know, when people come to faith and how, how it happens. And, and what they found is that like, in a family where nobody's Christians and the kid is the first one to become a Christian, there's like a 3% chance um, that the rest of the family will follow their lead. 3% chance, it's like, you know, everybody else is like, okay, um, we'll, we'll, we'll do this as well. Now, if it's the same family and it's mom who comes to faith first, uh, there's a 17% chance that the rest of the family is going to follow along, follow her lead and become Christians as well. However, whenever you take a family that doesn't go to church and you take a dad and he comes to faith, there is a 93% chance that the rest of the family is going to follow the lead. Okay? You catch that? 93% chance, men. And so what that means is this. Your impact on your kids and your family's faith cannot be overstated. You matter so much whenever it comes to the faith and the practice of your children just by being present, just by practicing your faith. So to all the dads and the grandpas and the men in the room, I implore you with everything I have. If you want your kids to have faith, if you want your family to have faith, then let them see you practice your faith. They will follow you. So, can I get an amen on that? Amen. amen. So, let's jump into the sermon uh, this morning. Uh, there's a question that I ask my wife six days a week. And I ask it multiple times because I forget things every once in a while. But um, this is my six-day-a-week question. What did we get in the mail today? All right? So, I, I ask her this all the time. I'll text her. Be like, what did you get? What did we get in the mail today? You know, it's like, well, it hasn't come yet. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning, Adam. Um, that doesn't come up that early. Um, I, I, will, I will call her. Whenever I call, I'll be like, hey, I'm coming home. Uh, what did we get in the mail today? You know? Um, I, I will even ask her. She's got this thing to where um, she signed up with the U.S. Post Office somehow. She even gets an email every day of what we're going to get in the mail every day. So, I can ask her early in the morning, hey, did you check your email yet? Do we know what we're we're getting in the mail today. And I don't even know why I asked this question. Because I get in the mail the same thing I get every day. You know what I get? Trash. That's it. It's just like we open our mail over the trash can is what we do. 98, 99% of our mail just gets thrown away. There are only two things that I open. One, our bills. Hooray, being an adult is so much fun. Okay? And then two are like personal notes, cards, and letters. Those are a lot of fun. To, to open up. And I really love the letters that I get um, to where somebody has like written something out in their own hand to me. And that doesn't even have to be very long or anything. It's just something really special about a handwritten, handwritten note, a handwritten letter. 
It was a couple months ago, we were uh, digging through some stuff looking for something. I think it was a birth certificate or, or something. And um, it, it, little known fact, uh, my daughter didn't have a birth certificate until she was like six um, because uh, I forgot to send it in. We found it in the diaper bag, though, five years later. Um, and so... <laughs> Well, we got that. So we were probably looking for like a diver, you know, for a birth certificate or something like that. And we were going through all of our stuff, and I came across a little folded up piece of paper that on the outside it just says a special note for you both. And it stopped me in my tracks. This is why I don't remember what we were looking for because immediately, whenever I saw this, I knew exactly who it was from. And it's from my grandma Gibson, my mom's mom. And uh, it's from her and uh, my, my granddad, Grandpa. Um, and it was written on the day of our wedding, and she gave it to us at our wedding. Uh, my grandma's now 95 years old, still kicking. She's going to live to be 130, I'm telling you. She's just going to do that. But, um, so I, I got this, and I just started to read this. This is a 19-year-old piece of, you know, piece of literature right here. And I started reading it, and I was just done. Because I, I could hear her voice. Um, I, I could hear my grandpa coming through the letter as well because I'm, you know, I know she wrote it, but I'm sure that he was talking to her the whole time. And it really just kind of, kind of just stopped me, and it just, just reminded me just how special two pieces of paper can be to someone because of who wrote it, what the occasion was, but just how, how the, the words that were on this page. Getting a letter is just such a, such a special occasion. And I will treasure these, this, these two pieces of paper all my days. It got me thinking. Letters are really, really special. What if you were to get a letter from Jesus? You ever wondered what that letter would look like? What it would sound like? What Jesus would say? You know, if you got a letter from Jesus and it said a special note for you, it was from him. You ever wondered what it might be that he said? What encouragements might he have for you? Maybe what are some of the difficult words that he might have for you as well? What if you were to receive a letter from Jesus? Apostle John is stuck on the island of Patmos. We'll talk more about that here in just a second. And Jesus shows up to him and he gives him his revelation. We call it the, the book of Revelation. And, and in that book of Revelation, there are seven letters written to seven churches from Jesus himself to his churches, laying out clearly what he is proud of them for and then other things that they need to work on. And they are instructions for them and for us as well all these years later to help them to understand how they can live faithful in an increasingly faithless world. And it's the same thing for you and for me. How can we remain faithful in an increasingly faithless world? So what we're going to do for the next seven weeks is we're going to look through these letters, seven letters, seven churches, seven weeks in this series, and we're going to look at each one of them, and then we're going to just kind of pull it apart, dissect them, learn some things, but then to ask the question, what is Jesus saying to them, but also, what is he saying to us. So we're going to be in the book of Revelation this morning. If you've got a Bible, I'd invite you to find it and uh, flip over to Revelation 2. If you need help finding Revelation, start off in index and go to the left just a little bit. Very last book of your Bible. If you've got maps, it's right before that as well. Um, as you're kind of turning to that, I just want to kind of just give you a little bit of background of, of where this, this book comes from. It's written by uh, the, the Apostle John, okay, the, the disciple John, the Apostle John, one of Jesus' best friends, great friend. He was there uh, whenever Jesus died. He was actually present at the cross. Uh, he's one of the first guys to the empty tomb as well. And then after resurrection, after ascension, John becomes this preacher leader in the early church. And um, he, he's preaching, he's teaching, doing all kinds of things. He, he gets to, to outlive all of the other disciples. Uh, he gets to hear about their stories, about how they were brutally executed and martyred for their faith. They tried to kill killed John, um, but he just wouldn't die, all right? Uh, they even boiled him alive in a cauldron of oil. He, w he wouldn't die. And so what they do is they exile him to this island of Patmos where he's all alone, all by himself, and he's just, he's just there, him and him alone. Well, one Sunday he's sitting there and he's lonely, no friends are around, and Jesus appears to him. 
And he shares with him these letters and this, this revelation here. Now, in these letters, they're, they're written to real churches that really did exist at one point. Okay? And the first letter is written to the, the, the church in Ephesus. And, and Ephesus was, was a big deal. Everybody say big deal with me. Big yeah. deal. It's a big deal, big city, about 250,000 people in that city. And it was, it was a place where commerce and trade, uh, tourism uh, was, uh, took place there. there. They had an amphitheater that sat 25,000 people at, at a time. Okay? So it's, it's a big city. Um, it was a big deal in the church world as well. Um, uh, we, we first see it in Acts 19, whenever the Apostle Paul shows up there and he starts teaching. And it says that he taught every day for a few hours every day for two days. Years Now, if you want to do the math, you can get to about 3,000 hours of teaching over two years. And people were giving up their lunch breaks, their nap breaks. They were giving all those things up so they could go and sit and learn at the feet of the Apostle Paul. After the temple is destroyed in 70 AD, Ephesus actually becomes the epicenter of the Christian faith. Okay, so whenever I say it's a big deal, I mean it is a big deal. It's why it is the first letter, and it's the first church that Jesus addresses in his letters. So I want you to do this. Turn to your neighbor real quick. Say, I'm ready to go. Do that one more time and sound like it, you, like you mean you're really ready to go. Okay, I'm ready to go, ready to go. All right, so, so here we go. Um, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write... These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown <laughs> Weary. Let's hit the pause button. Let me explain just a couple of things right here. So uh, first thing is he starts off, these are the words of him who hold the seven stars in, in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Um, a lot of talk about this, and what I think is going on here and what a lot of you know, smart people think is that Jesus is throwing shade at the emperor Domitian. Okay, so Domitian is the emperor of Rome at this point, and Domitian is a just terrible dude, just ter terrible guy. And one of the things that Domitian does that's different than every other Roman emperor is he declared himself to be Lord God and Savior at the beginning of his reign. Now, most of the emperors would end up being worshipped as a god, being worshipped as a savior, but it was always after they died. Domitian is the first one to go, nah, I think I am. And he said it about himself, I am Lord, God, and Savior. So one of the things that he did is he minted coins uh, with his image on it just to say, this is who I am. I'm God. I'm, this, is, this is what I'm doing. Now, just to realize how um, audacious this is, can you imagine if somebody was newly elected president, just has never been president before, you know, and on day one they walk in and they say, you know what? Tired of Abraham Lincoln on the $5 bill. I think I should be on the $5 bill because I'm that great. Okay, we would all be sitting here going, can we at least wait just a little bit? Can we make sure that, that you like, are a decent president before we do these things? Because that's like stuff we do after the fact. We don't do that while you're president. But that's what Domitian does. Starts printing all these coins up with him, declaring him to be Lord and Savior. Well, one of these coins, I've got a picture of the back side of it up here. Um, on the front side was a picture of his face, but on the back side what it has is a picture of a baby, which is his infant son who died... Um, just right after birth, sitting on the globe, and let's count them. Do you want to count the stars? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven stars. Sitting on the globe, meaning that he rules the world, and with the seven stars, he rules the entire universe, because that's what they understood to be the universe. Those are the, the stars that you can actually see. And so what Jesus is doing, whenever he says, here are the words of the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and walks amongst the seven lampstands. You, you know what he's doing? To these Ephesians who are walking around with these coins in their pocket with Domitian's face on it and his infant on the back declaring him to be son of God, he is looking at them and going, you know what, that dude makes coins, but I'm the real God. I'm the real deal. That dude is a counterfeit. He thinks that his son is son of God. No, I am the son of God. I am the king of God. Kings. He thinks he's Lord, God, and Savior. He wrong. I am that one. So Jesus is making a bold declaration 
of who he believes himself to be. Jesus continues on, and he says, I know your deeds. Know your deeds. So this is the um, attaboy section of the letter. Okay, so this is the, uh, hey, you're doing a good job. In fact, your notes, this is kind of how we, we broke it down. Like, you're doing a good job. And their, their good job is basically this. They, 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 they've been doing hard work. Okay, they're, they're hard workers. They serve day after day, week after week, year after year. They have been faithful, and they have worked hard. Um, they have persevered in the face of difficulty, because Ephesus is not an easy place to do ministry. It's really not. It's just a very, very difficult place. Um, there's opposition all around. It's a place where uh, they worship 50 gods and goddesses, at least 50 gods and goddesses. Um, it is a very immoral city. Uh, prostitution is legal. Um, they had brothels all around the place. In fact, one of the places that they had a brothel, they had a huge brothel right across the street from the great big library in the town. Why did they do that? So a guy could say to his wife, hey baby, I'm headed up towards the library, all right? And so, and that's what they would do. And then they would go to the brothel instead. Just a very immoral place. Domitian is there. He's worshiped as God and they put to death people who don't worship him as God. So it's a very difficult place to do ministry. He's like, but y'all, y'all, y'all are doing a great job. You're persevering. You're enduring hardship. Then he also says, you've done a great job with your doctrine, with your teachings. You know the truth. You've tested bad teaching. You have pure doctrine. You're smart. You're humble. You spent time with the scriptures. You've rejected false teachers. You've rejected the wolves that have tried to infiltrate the flock. Man, you've done a great job at working hard, persevering, and having great doctrine. Now, this is the point to where, you know, if I came up on a Sunday and said, hey, y'all, got great news. Um, We have a letter from Jesus. Okay, Jesus wrote us a letter. It's great. It's written in red letters. We should probably read it, you know. And so, um, and I started to read it. This is the point in the letter where we'd all be just turning each other like, oh, yeah, high five, high five. We're doing great, man. We're killing it. You know, we're doing a great job. And then we would come across this next part to where it says this. Yet, it's like, oh, man. Nothing, nothing good comes from after yet, you know? It's like, yet I hold this against you. You've forsaken the love you had at first. Consider, remember how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you don't repent, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you do have this in your favor. You're, you hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. I hold this against you. So the first part is the good job out of boys. This is the uh, bad job kind of section. It's like, yeah, you you need some work here. And the bad job is very simply this. Y'all lost your heart. You're not very loving. You're not very kind. You're all head and no heart. You're all knowledge and no emotion. You know what's right, but don't treat people right. He's like, I've got a problem with that. And it's such an easy slide. You, know, you start off in the beginning, and there's just so much love that is present. You've got love for God. You've got love for others. You've got love for lost people. You've got you know, love for your leaders, love for your church. You've got love for God. You've got all these things. It's just all so present. But then as time just continues to go on, and the clock continues to tick, and the calendar continues to be flipped over, it is just so easy to find our place to where we move, to move from this place of heartland, and we move to headland. And we just learn this, this connection between the two things that are right there. And so our knowledge puffs us up, and we speak truth but without love. We have work and perseverance, but it's a cold work and perseverance. And so Jesus looks at his church, he's like, hey, remember. Remember where you were. You remember what it was like in the very beginning. So so repent, stop doing what you're doing now, turn around. Let's go back to where you are and return to what you were doing in the beginning. And if you have ears, I am begging you, just please hear what I am saying. And you will have life. He who has ears, let him hear what Jesus says to the churches. So uh, kind of the way we're going to approach these, these next several weeks is in, in this way. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of walk through the text and we'll teach a few things. We'll help you understand a few things. Um, but then I always want to wrap it up with this. It's just like, I don't want us to just read this historically. Um, don't even want us to just read this theologically. I want us to read this with humility. And I want us to ask this question, it's like, so if this church, if they could have fallen into this, then I'm just going to go ahead and assume that I could probably fall into this as well. And how do I know if I'm acting like the Ephesians or acting like these other churches? How do I know if this is starting to go on in my life? And let's just humility, with humility, just admit, I, I see how this could happen in me. 
So we're going to ask a question. I'm going to give you three simple tests. I could probably give you a dozen tests, but I'll just give you three. And uh, so my, my question is this. How do I know if I've lost that loving feeling? Oh, <laughs> that loving feeling. Because it's gone, gone, gone. I got to finish it. Oh, it's gone. Once you're in, you're in, man. You got to keep going. So how do we know if we've lost that love and feeling? That's the problem with the Ephesians. They have no heart. How do we know if this is happening in our lives? Let me, let me give you three just simple tests here. Number one, uh, you can know you've lost that love and feeling if Jesus is conceptual, not personal. If Jesus has become a concept and not a person. If Jesus is just an idea to be discussed and not someone who is real. Is Jesus real to you? Or is he just this idea that exists out there? So here's the thing, friends. Jesus is not just somebody who is to be discussed. He is not just some subject that we are supposed to read about in a book. He is not just this idea that we need to debate and to argue and to go over all kinds of things. That's not who Jesus is. We can do those things, but that is not who he is. He is a person. He is a living person. He is alive right now, sitting at the right hand of God, interceding on your behalf and my behalf. He has gone there to prepare a place for us. Jesus is real. He is alive. He is not just this concept. He is personal. He holds all things together with his powerful word. He spoke all things into existence. And he wants you to know him as he knows you. He's not just this idea. Now, here's my fear. A lot of us know about Jesus, but we don't know Jesus. Do you really know him? Is he real to you? So here's the crazy thing. And this creator of the universe, the one who holds all things together, you know that, that, that guy we're just talking about? He, he really does want to know us. Personally, do you know him? Or is he just this vague concept that you've debated and you've argued with others? You know all about him. But he lives in headland, not in heartland. Beware, my friends. Because very often the people who know the most about Jesus actually know him the least. Is he just a concept? Or is he real to you? Uh, the second test would be this. You know you've lost that love and feeling whenever people have become annoying. People have become annoying. They become secondary. They have become objects of contempt. They have become just these, these people. It's basically you've lost mission. You've lost the viewpoint that what we've been called to do is to love God and to love others. We've been called to love others the way that Jesus has loved us. And, and it gets so to this point where people can just become annoying to us. And you want to know what's difficult about this one? Do you know why people can become annoying? Because people are annoying. All right, can we just, can we just agree on this, right? I mean, people are, some of you are like, oh no, what's he going to do? Um, no, people are annoying. I mean, we, that's just the problem. This is why this is so easy to get to this place. It is so, people can be so annoying. You go into the grocery store. There are annoying people all over the place. You know, they're, they're, they've got six carts going through the self-checkout line. It's like, seriously? And you've got coupons. No, don't do that. You know? Or you go, to, you go to work. There's annoying people at work. You go to school. There are annoying people at school. You go to the ball field. There are annoying people sitting in the stands on the field, sitting in the dugouts. Annoying people are everywhere, aren't they? I mean, can I get an amen on that? Amen. I mean, people, there are annoying people all over the place. And because people are annoying, it gets so easy to treat them with contempt instead of compassion. And what Jesus wants for us is to continue to Love them. Now, how do we do that? Well, we've got to remember that before God's love can go through us, it has to come to us. And so he looks at us, and so what, what we basically got to do is we've got to get to this point where we, we go, you know what, yeah, people are annoying, but you know what's true? I'm annoying. I'm grating. I know this about myself. And you know that to be true about you too. 
And yet, in spite of all of my annoyingness, God still loves me. God still died for me. He still went to uh, the tomb for me. He still rose from the dead for me. And if he can do that for me in all of my annoyingness, then I can do the same for others. And I can, in humility, love them as Jesus has loved me to treat them with compassion and not contempt. You know you've lost that loving feeling, though, whenever you forget that. And people are just simply annoying to you. Last thing would be this. You know that you've lost that love and feeling whenever you begin to think, I've done enough. Uh, You think, I've done enough. I've given enough. I've volunteered enough. I've, I've led enough Bible studies. I've cooked enough casseroles. I've rocked enough babies. I've volunteered enough hours. I've done my share. I've done plenty. It's time for me to go to the bench, take my jersey off, and hand it off to somebody else. It's somebody else's turn because I've... I've done enough. I think this might have been the problem for the Ephesians. They had a rich history, y'all. I mean, we're, uh, our church is, I think, 158 years old now. We've got a great history, a rich history, but it pales in comparison to the history of the Ephesian church. Just listen to their list of preachers, you know, that they had there. The Apostle Paul, he's pretty good, you know. Um, Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke. You got Timothy, who is Paul's Timothy, which is a funny joke. Um, and so uh, he, he was you know, Paul's son in the faith. Um, Priscilla, Aquila. Um, the Apostle John, the guy that's actually writing the book of Revelation, was one of the preachers, pastors of the church in Ephesus. Um, it said that uh, Jesus' mama, Mary, went to this church as well. Okay? They hosted councils where people would debate, you know, doctrine and theology and all those kind of things. So they have this incredibly rich, deep, powerful history. They've read the books. They've taken the exams. They, they, they've been through the classes. They've sent out church planners. It's so easy to get to that place to go, it's just, well, we, we've done enough. Somebody else should do something now. And Jesus looks at them and he just says, hey, where's the love? Where did it go? And here's what I love about Jesus. He doesn't go, go to guilt. You know, oh, you know what? Yeah, I mean, I guess you've done enough. I mean, I did die for you. But sure, sure, yeah, you've done enough. You could probably do a little bit more, but... He doesn't go to condemnation. He doesn't go, well, just remember, hell's hot. <laughs> just, just, just want you to remember that. He doesn't threaten them, just going, you know, I could call a meteor down. Right here. Put it right here in the church. Doesn't do any of those kind of things. He he just... He's like, what what about the love? He's like, well, you know, if you love me, like I love you, can't can't we just like keep this thing going? I mean, there's still people to reach. There's still truth that needs to be taught. There's still fights that need to be fought. What about the love? Can we keep going? I mean, because we're not, our work's not done yet. There's still people who need to know about this incredible love and this incredible compassion that I have for them. We're not done yet. Can we just keep on going? Can we keep on loving one another? Can we keep loving each other? And keep fighting on? I love that about Jesus. It's like, let's, let's just keep loving each other and let's see where that takes us. See, the church in Ephesus, it had a lot of things going right for it. And frankly, there, there are a lot of us sitting here today, you, you're, you're the same way. You've got a lot of great things going for you. I mean, you're smart, you're sharp, you've got great doctrine, you know, you're, you're moral people, you do the right things. But maybe, just maybe, like the church in Ephesus, you've moved from heartland to headland. And while you've got all the answers down, you've got all these other things going there, you know the truth, but you've, you've lost your heart that's where you find yourself today, then let me just give you the bottom line. Well, if you lose your heart, the answer is return to the start. Go back to where you were in the beginning. Remember your first love. Do those things that you did in the very beginning and find your heart again. Let me, let me pray over you. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for these words of Jesus. And I thank you, God, for the reminder that we can be right in our belief and our practice but wrong all at the same time if we just don't have any heart. If we're cold to you and we're cold to others. 
So God, give us the wisdom to see ourselves in this text. To see how we could find ourselves acting this way. And then help those of us who need to return to where we were and where we began with you. God, thank you for your patience and your grace. Amen.